our heart. Holy Spirit, Spirit of Revelation, come and reveal the Lord Jesus in His splendor and His beauty to us in a greater way. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is session 14. We're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 22, and this is, again, David experiencing beauty in the ash heap of depression, is what I'm calling this. Experiencing beauty in the ash heap of depression. David hits his all-time low, nearly. He actually hits it once or twice more. But it's all in this period called the Adullam years. And the Adullam years uh, have officially begun because David has has left uh, Gibeah never to return again in the same way that he was before. And he has been at Gath and at the city of Nob, and he's had two disasters in a row. In Gath, he had to uh, act in this very unbecoming way and in compromise and in fear. And then obviously what happened in the city of Nob is, is we just covered it. Okay, 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 to 5. Keep working on it. 1 Samuel 22, 1 to 5. David therefore departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam, so that when his brothers and all of his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to him. So he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. Then David went from there to Mizpah Mizpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother come here with you, till I know what God will do for me. So he brought them from before, uh, before the king of Moab. And they dwelt there with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Now the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold, but depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed there and went into the forest of Hereth. Okay, now what's happening in this uh, season of David's life is he's uh, officially beginning the Adullam years. Again, he is, he's been out of Gibeah for just a, maybe some weeks now, maybe a month or two. It's hard to know exactly. But the Gibeah, I mean, the Adullam years last a full seven years. They begin about age 23, and they go on till his third, until he turns 30 years old. So he's seven years running cave to cave, or at least in the wilderness. He spends 16 months in Ziklag, which was the one time of natural security, but he was out, out of the will of God. That was the problem. So this begins that principle in David's life where he experiences depression, but it's the principle of God's strategic delays because he's wanting to work into David something that will, will uphold David in the day of his prosperity. And one key principle is this, is that God will always give us the easiest path possible to prepare us for prosperity. God has a certain prosperity that He wants us to walk in, in different arenas of our life. And David is, and the Lord says, I'm going to give you the easiest path possible to get you ready for just a little bit of prosperity with the least amount of damage. Honestly. Because prosperity always damages human beings except the grace of God. Prosperity always damages human beings. We're simply made that way with sin. And so God has a counter program to keep us from being damaged with prosperity. He protects us with problems. Now it doesn't look that way because we're on this side. But He is protecting His authority in our life with problems. I know that sounds like a strange principle, but He does it. He told Paul the Apostle when he was, Paul was complaining about the thorns in the flesh, he said, Paul... He said, the thorns are there because you exalt yourself, even though you're a mature apostle. The thorns are there to protect you because you have my authority on you, to protect you from yourself, Paul. Because without these problems protecting you, you will do what all men do. You will get out of the will of God because of your pride. So God has these strategic delays 
And He's working grace in our heart for the purpose of protecting us. He protects us with problems. Now, we're always trying to get out of the problems. But God allows them so that we solve them and get a testimony in God. And get, we get a testimony of God's deliverance and we get roots deep in our heart that God's real. So a problem comes, we kick into the automatic gear of getting out of the problem. And the struggle of the caterpillar of the cocoon, the struggle to get free from the problem, creates a testimony in God and creates, of God delivering us in due time, and creates reality because we have to do that. I am loved, I am a lover, therefore I am successful. We have to do that to get out of the problem, to get out of the pain of the problem, the spin of that problem. So David's just beginning that. And the prayer closet that God has ordained for David is called the Cave of Adullam. Adullam is a city. The cave is just outside of the city. It's about 12 miles from Bethlehem. The Cave of Adullam is David's seminary. The Cave of Adullam is the seminary that he plans for us, even if we go to seminary formally. Going to seminary doesn't get us free from God's seminary. And in this cave, he has plenty of time to ponder. Maybe he has more time than is good for him. It dawns on him, and he makes it clear in Psalm 42, we're going to look at it in a few minutes, it dawns on him that Jonathan has left him. Everybody has left him, is what he says at the end of the day. He says, everyone has left me. He's thinking about the fact that he acted with madness before a king, a neighboring king. He's the great anointed of the Lord Faking madness. He's thinking, what was I doing? That was so dumb. And now the story's everywhere. He's thinking about the fact that he lied at the city of Nob and, and so many people were, were killed and the city was wiped out before it. It says in verse 1 that he escaped to the cave of Adullam and his brothers and all of his father's house heard of it and they went down there to him. Now, not his brothers in the military. Several of them were in the military. That's not the brothers he's talking about. He's talking about the other ones that were not... Uh, in the military at this point in time. Now, it's kind of a, an issue. Why did all of his father's house, aunts and uncles, cousins, you know, the little six-year-olds, they all gathered to David at the cave of Adullam. That doesn't make sense. Why would they go to the cave of Adullam and leave their houses? And why would they go to David? Well, it's, I'm, we're not going to look at this passage, but I'll just give it to you. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 13. It tells us what happened when David was lodging at the cave of Adullam. The Philistines made one of their usual raids. The Philistines throughout Saul's reign were constantly raiding the nation of Israel. When, they, you know, when Israel was just kind of relaxing, suddenly 500 soldiers would come through a little town and just decimate the town and just kill everybody and take all the livestock, etc. And uh, you know, it was really, really cruel and brutal in those days. In 2 Samuel 23, verse 13 and 14, it says the Philistines had just raided Bethlehem when David was in Adullam. And they said, well, we can't go to Saul, because if we go to Saul, he'll kill us to get to David. And we can't stay in Bethlehem because we're not warriors, and we, don't have, we can't withstand the Philistines. So David's up in the cave, and the whole gang comes up. I mean, aunts, uncles, cousins, the whole bit. Here they come marching up the hill. David! David's going, oh, guys, th this isn't a good place to live. This cave, it, it, this isn't good. This isn't a good place. And yet they all stay with him. And his brothers who were not in the military join him at that time. And so what he does with his parents, in verse 3 and 4, is, is that we read this already, is that he takes his parents to Moab, to the king of Moab. And the reason he takes his parents to the king of Moab is that if you will remember, if you just think about it, Jesse's grandmother, Jesse's his father, Jesse's elderly, Jesse had David uh, late in years, it says. So Jesse might be in his 70s or 80s, who knows for sure. But Jesse's grandmother was Ruth. You know Ruth, the Moabitess. She was from Moab. Well, she married Boaz and became the richest woman in Israel. And so she had tremendous relationships in the last two generations between Israel and Moab. And so David, who is the, the great-grandchild of Ruth, says, Hey, the king of Moab likes us. He likes our family. We've been sending them good gifts for years. They like us. And so 
there's, uh, there's all that's already established, and he brings his elderly parents there, and they, and they go to the cave. I, I mean, they go to the strongholds of Moab. Now, Gad breaks it on the scene here in verse 5. Gad's one of the three prophets in David's life. I mentioned the last time is that when David was young, the older prophet was Samuel. When David was in his 20s, his contemporary was Gad. was with him all of his days. And when David was old, Nathan was the young prophet to the older king. So he had three different prophets that are uh, emphasized and pronounced in David's reign here. And so Gad just kind of appears on the scene right here in verse 5. The prophet Gad comes to David and he says, the Lord wants you to know He doesn't want you in the, stronghold, the strongholds of Moab, in the hiding up there. He wants you in Judah. He doesn't want you in Gath. He doesn't want you in Moab. I want you in Judah, thus says the Lord. Judah, David says, but that's where Saul's going to get me. He goes, if I go to Judah, Gad interrupts, you have to trust God every day, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, Judah's dangerous. It's not very big. There's 3,000 assassins. Gad says, well, the Lord insists on you staying in Judah. He really wants to give you a testimony so that you will be a, a, a godly king when he gives the nation to you. I'm sure he probably didn't say it just like that, but that's what it comes down to. And so he couldn't uh, hang out in, uh, in Moab. And he couldn't hang out in, in uh, uh, Gath. Okay, now what happened, the key part of this passage is in verse 2. It says in verse 2 that everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was discontented gathered to David. There's about 400 of them. All of these guys that have no money, that have a chip on their shoulder against the government. They're discontented. They don't like Israel. They don't like Saul. They don't like the policies of the nation. They're angry. And they're depressed or distressed. They're just angry, broke, and discontent about everything. This gathers to David and becomes David's army. Now we find in 2 Samuel 23, this army is transformed into the mighty men of David. This is often referred to as the most powerful youth group in history. Most of them were young men. And they came really rough and they came angry, and they came without any spiritual depth, and it was David's life before them that transformed them. Not all of them were transformed, but many of them became mighty men of David. They became mighty in God and mighty in war under the leadership of the Lord. And there's all kinds of different pictures that are derived from these young, the motley crew of David. I said one time, and the youth go, no, you can't say that, because that means something bad to them or something. So it's a messed up group of young people. David transforms them under the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is uh, often, this passage is depicted as a picture of Jesus. David is homeless. Jesus was homeless. David was hunted and hated. Jesus was hunted and hated by the Pharisees. Jesus, David was gathering a very small, broken, messed up army. And Jesus gathered a small band of people. David's were in distress and dead and discontent. Jesus is not many noble, not many wise among you, Paul the Apostle would say. David is outside of the structure of Israel, outside of the camp. Jesus was out, his group was outside of the structure of Israel. And it's easy to find the similarities between Jesus and David. David is a type of Jesus in this context here. Okay, turn to Psalm 142. We find out what was going on in David's heart. Psalm 142. Psalm 142 and Psalm 143 go together. <clears throat> and then the flip side of this is Psalm 57. The flip side of this is Psalm 57. They have to, all three of these Psalms have to go together to make sense. And the order is important as well. He wrote Psalm 142, then Psalm 143, then Psalm 57. Psalm 142 and Psalm 143 is the depression side. He is seriously depressed. Psalm 57, he breaks through the depression and walks in 
the beauty of the Lord. He walks in power in his heart. He finds his way through the depression and this most difficult circumstances. Severe disappointment has settled in. Remember, David was the darling of Israel. All the young maidens were singing his praise. He was over the entire army at one time. He was the favored of the nation. And now he's being chased and pursued. And a city has been slaughtered. And he's been humiliated in another nation in Gath. Everything is going bad. Everyone has forsaken him. It says in verse 1, I cry to the Lord with all of my voice. With, with my voice. with my voice to the Lord I make supplication. I pour out my complaint before Him. I declare before Him my trouble. It is right to express our complaint. Matter of fact, the Lord would rather we express it to Him instead of express it to everyone else. Because when we express it to everyone else, it's called a complaining spirit. We express it to the Lord, it's called prayer. Again, when we, bring our anxiety, when we try to meet our anxiety outside of God, our pressures outside of God, it's called anxiety. When we meet it in God, it's called prayer. It's called faith. The Lord says, I don't want you voicing your complaint around. Take your complaint to me. That was, of course, as we've said, one of the great qualities of David's life, his ability to bring his complaint to the Lord. Here he starts, and he gets real specific. Verse 3, my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Now, this is not an exaggeration. David says, I was utterly despairing. But David, you've got all these great promises. Well, they didn't happen for 20 years. I know, David, but you're going to be one of the main guys. Hang on and be quiet. Well, you're going to live in eternity for the next billion, billion years. Hang on and be quiet. Your promises are as great as David's are in reality. Just a moment from now, you'll be in the celestial city in a breath. That's what the Scripture says. Our life is a breath. So whatever logic we would give to David, we have to use ourselves. In a moment, we're all going to be crowned as kings as well. In the grace of God. Yeah, but that's different. David was going to get his a couple years before we got ours. So why is he complaining? Well, the deal is we get to see the whole story with David. We don't get to see our whole story. With the whole story laid out, it only makes sense. Psalm 142 doesn't seem like a tragedy. But when you're only halfway in the story, it does seem like a tragedy. But let me tell you, as clear as David's story is finished, so is yours. David said in one, Psalm 139, all of my days were already written in the book. Your days are all written in the book. The story is as complete for you as it is for David here in the Word. David says, my spirit was overwhelmed within me. I completely get lost the hope that this thing would ever change. He's overwhelmed. Even David, with the power of the Spirit on him, God is hiding his face from David. God is testing David. It's the dark night of the soul, if you will. The Spirit of God is not manifesting on David's heart as he did in days gone by. David would know the, the presence of God again. The number one thing in David's life through the whole journey is, Lord, show me your face. Don't hide your face. Oh, I rejoice in the countenance of God shining on me. The countenance of God or the face of God means His manifest presence on his heart. It ebbed and flowed in David's life like it does in our life. When it was strong, David could, he could stand before anything. And when it, the presence of God was not manifest strong in his heart, he was weak as other men. And he's in a time of weakness. But God's using all of these seasons to prepare David for, for prosperity. That's really what he's doing. He's preparing David for prosperity. Because prosperity ruins us. So God protects us with problems. It gives us a testimony of deliverance, so God seems real, and it causes roots of our communion with God to go deep. Those two things protect us in the day of calamity, which is the day of prosperity. And of course, everybody, you're all like me. I always tell God I'm different than all you guys. I say, Lord, I'm different than them. I won't do what they do. And we all imagine ourselves to be different. Every one of us say, well, we would be different. We will keep a sane, objective thinking with options. We're not like the other folks. See, what prosperity is, is more options. That's what prosperity is. When you have the favor of God upon you in relationships, you have a lot more people that want stuff for you and your options to burn your life out or to handle that position of influence in a self-serving way are multiplied and nobody will stop you. 
When you have more money, you can buy or do more things, go more places. Many, many things happen when prosper. You have more anointing, you fill up stadiums if you have enough anointing. Fill up auditoriums all over the world. That creates money. That creates options. That creates decisions. That creates, it's all called temptation. Options is a nice word for temptations. They come everywhere. And most people under temptations, when they're not hemmed in, they just yield to them. And the very prosperity with the added options breaks them. There's thousands of stories of the, you know, of the instant success stories in the entertainment world or the athletic world of the young guy or gal, 2022, and they now have millions. And by the time they're 30, they're broken dead. Because the millions, they couldn't contain the options. They just went with them. They imagined they never would, and then they did. Because they're like, we don't have power in our hearts to, to stay in front of options without breaking under the power of options. Options are prosperity. More anointing, more favor, more money, more ease is way more options, and all of us would be broken under them. So the Lord says, I'm going to protect you, David. These options will really mess you up. And David messed up a few more times, but... David, the Lord says, I'm going to make it as easy as possible to have you mess up the least amount as possible, David, without just killing you in the process. And even David still messed up and hurt the nation, although he, his legacy was greater than his, his damage, but he did damage as king as well, even with all this training. Peter did some of that. Peter, this mighty apostle, in Galatians 2, he has a big controversy. He yields to the fear of man. You know that thing he before the little servant girls, and he got afraid, and he denied the Lord. Well, it didn't exactly fully get cured in Peter. Galatians 2, Paul and Peter had a controversy, and Peter yielded to the fear of man in Antioch and caused tremendous problems in the early church for a season. And he was a mature apostle when it was happening. The Lord says, well, Peter, we've got to go back and rework that through one more time. It's a little tough when all the main guys like you to tell them no under pressure. And Peter says, it's tougher than I thought it was. I thought I could tell them no, and, but I re they really like me, and they're really the main guys, you know. And it was just harder than I thought. It's called the fear of man. We all have it. The reason I'm saying this to you is that problems really seem overdone when they're related to us. They seem really reasonable when we le read the big picture of somebody else's life. And yet the Lord whispers in our heart, I won't, I'm making it as easy as possible so I can give you some prosperity with the least amount of damage. But when the story is down, done, then it makes so much sense. My spirit was overwhelmed within me, David said. Then you knew my path in the way which I should walk, for they have secretly set a snare for me. He says, God, the only thing that sustained me, and I'm totally depressed, is I knew that you knew what I was going through. And this is a perfect time to put in Psalm 139. We'll probably look at Psalm 139 next week. But David said, "You, I knew that you knew. You can read Psalm 139, 1 to 6 right now. You can put it there where he says, God, you know my path. You know my lying down and my rising. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It exhilarates me to know that you really know and that I really know that you really know. It gives me a sense of inward security. And that's where David's beginning out of depression starts right here. Is that he knows, he knows with revelation that God knows what's going on and God knows with care. That this thing has strategy to it, has purpose to it. And that's why I'm telling you this little thing about problems. It has purpose. Our problems have purpose to help us. We just never really believe that. We never really know that God knows what He's doing. Our problems always seem exaggerated and too extreme. But David connected, you know my path. You know what I'm going through. And it makes sense to you, God. You know in the way in which I walk, or you know the way, you know my weaknesses and my strengths. You know the manner in which I walk before you and what I need and what I don't need. Beloved, when God convinces you that He knows your frame, like Psalm 139 says, so therefore the Lord goes you know, a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that, because he knows the way you walk. He knows your particular aptitudes to good things and bad things. So God has a tailor-made plan just for you. And I assure you, he has the easiest plan possible for you to have prosperity with the least amount of damage. When I believe that, something exhilarates and is exhilarating inside of me. 
Look on my right hand and see. This is the, David's talking to the Lord. He goes, look, no one acknowledges me. I believe in his heart. He says, Jonathan tells me, he's with me to the end, that Jonathan is in the king's palace right now and I'm in the cave of Adullam. He keeps telling me he's for me, but he won't come and stand with me. He goes, nobody knows what I'm going through. Well, David, you have 400 men along your side. These guys, forget it. Nobody knows what I'm going through. No one acknowledges me. Listen to that next line. No one cares for my soul. Refuge has failed me. All of my safety systems aren't working. Boy, what when you hit rock bottom? You're spiritually overwhelmed. Not one person knows what you're going through. All of your safety mechanisms are not working. All of your refuges have failed. All of them. Nobody even cares what you're going through. David says, I am utterly abandoned. And the Lord says, I have you right where I want you. I am your only way out of pain. Me and me alone. This is divinely orchestrated. I am sure every one of us in this room feel a number of times and in the last 10 years that we, nobody understood what we were going through. It's a very, very strategic, divinely designed place to put you in. This is where God puts men and women after His own heart so that the fire of His reality is the only thing we can lean on. We say, oh Lord, You're my portion. You're all I want. He says, well, how come you don't come to me when it's going good like you say you do? Well, Lord, I always tell people I come to you. I know that you always tell them you come to you. You even bring the books around that talk about coming to me. But you don't come to me until you get in pain. You're just like all the others. All of us are like this. Imagine, verse 4, imagine really saying not one person understands what I'm going through. So what did David do? He had one, other, one option, verse 5, to cry out to God. And look at this. Made God his safety and made God his portion. And the word portion put the word my reward. One of the great Davidic themes through Psalms, God is David's reward, not his kingship. The unfolding of God to his spirit was David's primary reward. Psalm 16, verse 5. All, actually, all through Psalms, David constantly is calling God his inheritance, his reward, his, his portion, his cup. It's all the same idea. You're my cup, my portion, my reward, my inheritance, my hope. All of that means, it doesn't mean that you're the way out of trouble. You are what sustains my inward life. Uh, interacting with you is my pleasure, my primary pleasure in life. Beloved, there is a direct correlation of verse 5 to verse 4. Verse 5 happens when verse 4 takes place. The reality of God being your main reward happens when you're abandoned, even though you're in the midst of 400 people in tight living quarters. Nobody knows who David is. They don't understand. Nobody knows what he's about in the Lord. Matter of fact, every time David wants to do an act of righteousness, they're always trying to talk him out of it. They go, David, you're fanatical. Dial down. Kill the guy. David says, I can't kill Saul. They go, kill him. Well, he, we don't like Saul. Saul doesn't like us. Let's call it even. David had, was constantly being resisted by these 400 guys when he went to walk in righteousness. But he constantly was praising the Lord in front of them. And they were looking at him going, we don't get you, David. I mean, just think of the annoyance of having people thinking you're off the wall and you're all living in the same cave. Sharing the same bats and rats. Anyway... Verse 5 is deeply related to verse 4. It really is. When God brings you to verse 4, it is a divine strategy. It's not an accident. He goes on in verse 6, I'm very low. I'm very low. My enemies are stronger than me. The Lord says, I wanted it that way. It's not an accident, David. You are now defeated, David. Look at this. This is not an accident. David says, I am your strength. You're going to learn things in me, David. You're going to have experiences of me delivering you in circumstances, and you're going to find reality in your heart because of this lonely place. How many of you have, verse 3, my spirit overwhelmed? Verse 4, nobody knows. 
nobody cares. Verse 6, I'm very low. My enemies are stronger. Verse 7, it gets even worse. My soul is in prison. My soul is in prison. The Lord, or, the Lord allows our soul to be held in prison for seasons so that in the struggle, it's, again, it's the caterpillar and the cocoon, the struggle out, the interaction with God, the struggle, you go cut open that cocoon, the caterpillar dies. You let the caterpillar struggle, it becomes a butterfly. You help it out, it dies. Literally, it never flies, it dies. And we're struggling, and the Lord says, I'm too wise and I care too much to cut the caterpillar, the cocoon open. Struggle. And at the end of the day, you will live in reality of praise. You will know me at the end of the day. Bring my soul out of prison. He goes on in Psalm 143. He stays right with it. Hear my prayer, Lord. In your faithfulness, answer me. He's just going on and on. I tell you, a man of God in, in the prison of pain hurting. Here he is in the prison of pain hurting. Well, if you're really a man or a woman of God, you shouldn't be in the prison of pain hurting. No. If you're really a man of God, a woman of God, you will be brought very low because you will discover the core reality of life, that God is your portion. It's all about bringing us to chapter 42, verse 5. David says to the Lord, he goes, don't enter into judgment with me. Remember, the city of Nob was just a couple weeks ago. Don't enter into judgment with me. For in your sight, nobody... No one living is righteous. That's what I was saying in the last session. Just settle the issue. You're never going to produce something that gets God's attention to go, wow, this is a different setup. It's never going to happen. David says, don't enter into judgment. The reason he's going to say that is because he's going to ask for his, his, uh, his enemies to be crushed. <laughs> I mean, here he is. He just caused the city of Nob to be slaughtered. Now he's asking for the evil ones to be crushed. Like David, like, let a little time go by. For the enemy has persecuted my soul. He has crushed my life to the ground. Instead of crushed my life, put the word heart. He's crushed my heart. I'm dwelling in darkness. He, of course, David was literally in the darkness of a cave, literally. But he means my heart is crushed. He goes, I can't see the end right now. I know that I was promised to be king by Samuel. I know that things will get better. And I know that God's spirit of revelation that I'm so familiar with will rest on me again. But I'm in darkness. I can't feel God at all. My soul is in prison. Nobody cares about me. The only thing I know is that God knows the way that I walk. God knows how I'm made on the inside. He knows what I need. That's the only thing I can live by right now is that God knows this. Crushed. His heart is crushed. Anybody got a crushed heart tonight? Anybody live, dwelling in darkness, you can't see what two years is going to bring. You, there's no way out. You can't see the way out. You're living in darkness. The Lord says, well, I'm training you like David then. This is the path of a man or a woman after God's own heart. He says it again, verse 4, my spirit's overwhelmed. It's the same. He's, it, really, it's the same flow as Psalm 42, 142. My heart is distressed. Now he puts his foot down and he starts the recovery process right here. The only thing sustaining him up to now is verse 3. He knows that God knows his path and God knows his propensities, the good ones and the bad ones. He says, I know that you know, therefore I know it's tailor-made what you're doing. When David said, I know that you know the way I walk, he's saying, I know this is a tailor-made plan. That's what David's really saying. But now he's going to say three very, very significant things that are the, that are the next stages of his deliverance. See, stage one is Psalm 52. He knows that God is good and God has done it and it's mercy that he lives by. That's, stage, that's step one. Stage two of coming out of depression, he knows Psalm 142, verse 3. He knows that it's a tailor-made plan. God knows his way, the way he walks, his strengths and weaknesses, and God is doing something to protect him. David knew that. He knew it was mercy because of his sin and he knew it was a tailor-made plan. He knew the plan was good. And then he's going to give three more things right here. Verse 5. I remember the days of old. He remembers his history in God. He goes, I remember when by grace you were moving on me and the, the memory of your work in my life in the past actually helps me right now. David 
purposefully recalls the activity of God in the earlier days of his life in the Lord. I remember the good old days, how you move, because you're the same God. If you did it five years ago, the same God that did it is the same today. That means it's in your heart to do it again. So David recalls, he purposefully remembers the journey God has taken him on. Number, the next thing he does, I remember all of your works. I remember all of your works. This talks about God's redemption. This is what we get from the Word, the whole history of redemption. We remember what God did in David. See, we're remembering God's works right now by reading the life of David. That's what we're doing. We study the life of Joseph. We study the life of Paul. We study the great men and women through history, and we remember God's works through history, through redemptive history. And then he goes, I meditate or I muse on the work of your hands. Now he goes to, he takes it up to his Psalm 19 uh, gear, his Psalm 29, when David gazes on the beauty of God in natural creation. He goes, I'm going back to the old tried and true method of worshiping God by connecting. Wait a second. You are beautiful and filled with splendor. What am I doing? This isn't an accident. He would, what David's doing is he's connecting into the beauty of God in the big picture. That's what he's doing. See, in Psalm 52, he gets the mercy, God is good. He doesn't have to earn forgiveness. That's massive. That's always step one. That was just literally a few weeks before he wrote this. Then he goes up a notch. He knows in Psalm 142, verse 3, God has a tailor-made plan. It's not too severe. It's made according to the way David walks, the way David's designed. But number three... Verse 5 here of Psalm 143. He remembers the way God has dealt and led him in the past. And he remembers victories in the, in his old, in the, in the good old days of his life. Now he's, he's, memori- he's meditating on redemptive history. He's, he has to go look back at Moses and how God delivered Moses. And anything in redemptive history. We have the whole Word of God. This is where we put the Word of God. That's the fourth thing David meditates. The fifth thing, he's looking at the, nat- the beauty of God in natural creation. He's he's purposely reconnecting with the big pictures, what's going on. Verse 5 is three ways he's connecting with the big picture. You connect with the big picture of the beauty of God, and you add that to God as a tailor-made plan that's not too severe, and He's forgiven you. That is the way out of the tailspin. This This is a Holy Spirit, revelatory divine pattern of how to get out of the tailspin. So people say, okay. So they go home, they just turn on the TV channel, serve, eat their potato chips and stay depressed. We need to lock our minds into the Word of God. That's what David did. This isn't just something we go, yeah, that's a good verse. And I'm a, This is something we do. We really do this. This isn't something we just go, wow, cool, and then remember it on the test. Well, little hint. And he says in verse 6, he says, God, let me just say it to you. I long for you. I'm thirsty for you. I'm thirsty for that feeling of God again. I'm thirsty for the face, the countenance. The Lord says, you just keep doing those three things in verse 5, and your thirst will be touched like it was in the old days. You keep doing the, the three things of verse 5. Connect yourself with the big picture. I can't stress this. It's not enough just to learn these three things and say them. We have to literally do them. And God says in verse 6, David... You keep spreading your hands hands out to me, you long, I'll touch your thirst. You'll know my countenance shining on you again. You'll know the release of my presence again. David says, my hands are out to you all the time. I'm reaching, I'm reaching. I remember how to connect with you. I'm reaching. I'm posturing myself, reaching, I'm reaching. Remember Psalm 52, how he ended it last session? Waiting on the Lord in the midst of the people. But it's not just that he had confidence to wait on the Lord. He actually waited on the Lord as well. It wasn't just that he, he felt the liberty to, he did it to. He actually put his heart, his cold heart, before the blazing fire. Answer me speedily, Lord. My spirit fails. Don't hide your face. It always comes down to the manifest presence of God, the face of God, the countenance of God. Verse 8, I want to hear, that I want to feel the loving kindness of the morning again, God. I want to wake up in the morning feeling the, the new mercies like I used to. 
The Lord says, well, you keep doing verse 5 then. You keep putting yourself in front of me. Well, Lord, why do I ever lose the feeling of you? Because I'm working in you humility. If all you have is victory, 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 then you will look at people that don't have freshness with me and you'll criticize them and judge them. And I, and I, am, I am meek and lowly and I want you meek and lowly. So I'm going to withhold it and produce gratitude in you when I give it back to you. And you won't have judgment in your heart towards people that don't have the presence of God in their hearts. The reason I know that one is that I've, there was times I felt the presence of the Lord and I, when I was younger in my 20s and I had a, a, a healthy, regular prayer life and I got into this, well, that kind of even, you know, pray. You know. And then the Lord took the anointing off of me. But my problem is I was arrogant enough. I announced it enough about how dedicated in prayer I was and the whole church knew. So I had to keep going to prayer meetings. And I was tortured. <laughs> because my pride kept me in the prayer meetings. And the Lord was dealing with my pride, so He lifted His presence off. And I went for about three or four months, and I'm in dry toast. And I said, God, I will never, 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 never think that Your presence on my heart was about me. Never. I promise. I promise. And then when somebody says, oh, so-and-so, they don't even pray. Hey, don't go talk to somebody else, man. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going there. Uh-uh. I'm not going there. I remember that in my early 20s when I was pastoring a church. I was preaching on prayer and everybody. I was the man of prayer. And the Lord hid His face from me. And I know verse 8 caused me to hear your loving kindness. Let me wake up feeling the, that impulse in the Word, that tenderness in the Word, O oh God. And the Lord says, you put your heart in front of me and let me teach you by releasing and withholding my presence. I'll teach you the path of humility through it. And of course, that's a, a lifelong journey. He says, let me know the path I'm to walk in, God. I lift my soul to you. He's really putting his heart before the Lord. Look at verse 10. For you are my God and you are good. Your spirit is good. You are my God. Your spirit is good. He's connecting. He's, it's, he's warming up. Verse 11, revive me. Bring my soul out of trouble. He doesn't mean just cause the mean guys to disappear. His soul was barren. There's basically three things David wants in these psalms. Number one, he wants a renewed heart. That was always David's number one priority. He wanted his heart communing with God, with the anointing. Number two, he wanted blessed circumstances. There's nothing wrong with that, but that was really number two. And number three, he wanted wisdom on what to do, how, what choices to make. He wanted, and that's listed a couple of times in there, he wanted to know the way to walk. In other words, do I go right or left? Do I, you know, do I go here or do I go there? He wanted... He wanted direction. But the first thing all through these two psalms is the cry for his heart not to be crushed in the presence of God. Okay, very quickly, let's go to Psalm 57. Psalm 57. This is the other end of this. Same time. Look at both of them in the margin. It's when David's in the cave of Adullam. Or the title at the top, I mean. It's, it's when David is in the cave of Adullam. Verse 1 to 5 is the prayer. Verse 6 to 11 is the confidence that David has. David's, he's, it's written at the same time, but he has a note of victory this time. A note of victory. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For my soul trusts in you. He already has his bearing. But David has this, this mercy thing. Again, I, I can't say it too many times. Everywhere you go at every season of David's life, mercy is the number one attribute David is is uh, talking about and rejoicing in. He says, for my soul trusts in you now. He's, he's made his way through. He doesn't have the despair here. He says, and in the shadow of your wings, I will make you my refuge until these calamities pass away. He goes, I have faith now. I'm not overwhelmed. I know they will pass. I know they have come for a season and they will pass in God's time. He's crying out to God, verse 2. He's not scheming. He says, God, you alone. I have no way out of this thing. I'm hemmed in. And I love this, this famous David phrase. To God who performs all things, here it is, for me. David's always said, talking about God doing it for me. In Psalm 56, when he was in Gath, verse 8, 9. All my tears are in your bottle. I know you'll defeat my enemies. This I know because you're for me. David had this 
You delighted me. You're for me. One of David's favorite phrases is, I know you'll do it for me, God. I know I'm your favorite. And every believer in Christ Jesus can claim they're God's favor. But David really did it. He goes, I know that you're going to do it for me. Not just, quote, for your glory. You like me. I know you like me. David had this line that God would establish his glory. Saul was not the most high. Now, obviously, we know that because Saul's not chasing us. But the Saul's in our life seem like the most high. The pressure is the most high. But it isn't the most high. God is. I know, but this thing is never going to go away. That is not most high. God is the most high. David calls God the most high. Verse 4, my soul is among lions. I, lay among, I lie among sons. of men who are set on fire. He's talking about Saul. They hunt to devour him like a lion. They're on fire to kill David. And you know why they're on fire? They're going to be rewarded. Saul always rewarded the people that did the dirty work. Even David on a couple occasions before Goliath. Whoever gets Goliath gets my good daughter. And he kills Goliath, he gives him the challenging daughter. He's always offering rewards if people will do the dangerous work. And these guys are on fire. They have one thing on their mind. They want to get the reward of killing David. David says, they have fire in them for me. They're lions. They're hunting me to devour me. Verse 5. He taps into the Psalm 19. David always goes back to the beauty of God in the heavens. He just never got free from that. You know, he always, when he was under pressure, he says, the one thing I count on is that early revelation you gave me, he would look up and just be lost in wonder and says, yeah, you know, it kind of refocuses me to who it is that's leading my life. Then verse 6 to 11. Verse 6 to 11, he, he's now expressing his confidence. They prepared a net. My soul is bowed down. His soul being bowed down this time, I believe, is in humility. I don't think he's crushed like he was in Psalm 142 and 143. The whole language is different. I think he's been humbled. I think he's finding the Lord and he has humility. Because in verse 7, he says this two times. It's like verse 1, he called out to mercy twice. Verse 7, I'm steadfast. My heart is steadfast. He's broke through here. I believe the bowed down heart of verse 6 is the humility that God was after in this season of David's life. Because in verse 7, he's resolute. He goes, my heart is set, O God. My heart is fixed, it says in another version. My heart is fixed on thee, O God. I remember hearing a sermon on that when I was 21, 22. I heard it. And this became a phrase that I used for years and years. I, I don't know that I've used it the last 10 years, but for 10 years I used Psalm 57, verse 7. I used to write it down all the time in my prayer notes. My heart is fixed, O God. I would feel the pull and the tear, and I'd say... I don't know what to do. I just put the anchor down. You love me. You're like me. You, you're with me. I'm fixed. I can't go by anything else. I'm just putting an anchor in the ground, and that's my compass. I'm fixed. And I would quote this. I heard somebody preach a sermon on it. It deeply impacted me. The David in the Adullam spin out, he put that anchor down. He put that stake in the ground. He said, my soul is fixed. When he worked through the heaviness, the heavy parts of the depression, he got back to, you know, to, to, you know, to level ground a little bit, and he set his soul. There is a place where we set our soul. And I just, I would to God that young people would take this. That, that thing, that verse did so much for, for me in my 20s and early 30s. I will sing, I will give praise. Now he says in verse 8, oh, I love this. He says, awake my glory, awake my glory. Now, what he's talking about here, when he says, awake my glory, he's talking about the deepest parts of his heart. He's talking about his deepest recesses of affections when he says, awake my glory. In Psalm 16.9, it's clear he's talking about his heart when he calls it his glory. Psalm 16.9. Psalm 30, verse 12, the same thing. When he talks about his glory, he's talking about all the affections within him. He says, I'm steadfast. I'm fixed in verse 7. He goes... Oh, heart, awaken to full, to full heartedness. Now, he can't do that on his own power. You can't make your heart passionate, but you can make decisions that position your heart in the right way and put your heart in front of the Word of God. He's made two decisions. His heart is steadfast, 
And he wants his heart to be awakened. He says, awake, lute and, and harp. Awake, he, these two stringed instruments. He, you know, he's been in, in the city of Nob and he's been in, in Gath. And now he's, he's in the cave and he's pulling out the instruments. He's going, I'm going to get back into the flow. It's been a, a dark night for a season. He says, I'm pulling out the instruments again. I'm going to have my heart flow in the river. Awake, O oh, gl- my glory. That means let my heart flow in that river again. And I'm going to start singing unto the Lord again. I'm going to restore the place of my personal devotions. And he says, God, I will awaken the dawn. I'll wake up in the morning with my devotions before you. I'm not going to wait and see how the day goes. I'm just going to wake up and give myself to you. And he says, I will awaken the dawn. Of course, when he started playing guitar to awaken the dawn, he had 400 guys in the same cave. You know, they're going, hello, David. He woke up everyone else as well. He made the cave of Adullam ring. He made it sing. He said, I will praise you among the peoples. The 400 says, yes, this is true. He did this. I will sing among the nations. This is really interesting. Again, among the Gentiles, the unbelievers. And he goes back to the old mainstream, the old tried and true. It's mercy again. He goes back to Psalm 36, verse 5. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. The, the five things of Psalm 36, 5 that David always looked at. Mercy reaches to the heavens. He uses that a lot. Mercy that is, that is so extreme in its vastness. It's as vast as going clear to the stars. That's what he means. And then in verse 11, he talks about the glory of God, the beauty of God. Again, he, he's now entering into that beauty of God dynamic where he's singing of his beauty. He's connecting with it. He connected in the big picture back in chapter 143, verse 5. He decided to meditate on those three things and it brought him out of the despair cycle. I'm not saying it did it in a day. But David did what the Scripture says to do to help pull us out of these negative mindsets. What we do is we get into despair. We don't do what David did and we stay in despair year after year after year after year. David discovered the beauty of the Lord in the ash heap of his own depression. Amen. Let's stand. Some of you are in despair right now. And you're struggling in your heart. And you're saying to the Lord, Lord, I want to do this thing. I want to get back to this thing. I want to get back to being connected to you, Lord. Let's open your heart before the Lord. Instead of even coming up, let's just worship the Lord privately because all of us need to reconnect. You know, there's nothing wrong with watching TV and a little entertainment here and there, but we need to connect our hearts with the fire. David was overwhelmed and in despair. He said, Lord, you're good in Psalm 52. I'm going to lay that condemnation thing said in Psalm 142, it's tailor-made for me, God. It's tailor-made for who I am. It's not too severe. That cuts off the self-pity. I know it's wise. And he started remembering his history in the Lord, deliberately remembering it, drawing it up, looking at it, looking at the old dreams, the old journals, the old places where the Lord visited you, touched you, warmed your heart. He studied redemptive history, and I don't mean history itself, but the Acts of God in the Word. The book of Acts, the Gospels, the life of David, the life of Joseph, the book of Psalms. He filled his mind. He studied the beauty of the Lord in creation. He asked to be revived. He said, oh, revive me. I'm putting my heart in front of the fire. I'm steadfast. He got the courage to be steadfast. He asked his heart to be awakened. Awaken, my glory. Awaken. Flow in the river like you used to. I'm pulling out the instruments again. I'm putting on the worship music. I'm waking up the dawn with worship. I don't care what they say. I'm locking into the mercy of God again. He ends this whole dilemma with the mercy of God at the end of that song. So 
Just talk to the Lord now. Have mercy on me, my unfailing love. Have mercy on me, Redeemer. Please open my eyes, my soul now set free. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.